All engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. What that essentially means is discovery is advances, advances, questions, research, technology. Unbelievable. Without further ado, this is The Naked Scientist. Hello, welcome to The Naked Scientist. This is the show where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine. I'm Chris Smith. And I'm James Titko. Children come in and the very first time they look at the Avench playground and it's like, wow, yeah. they're in awe, yeah. basically, with what they see. With public health officials seriously concerned about children's physical and mental health, could the solution be child's play? The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. Now this week we're looking at the public health challenges facing children growing up in 21st century Britain. The Commission for Young Lives set up in 2021 to safeguard the most vulnerable kids in the wake of the pandemic have used the word disaster to describe the current state of children's mental health. Meanwhile, when it comes to physical health, the WHO have warned that the UK is on the verge of a child obesity epidemic. With us to explain why the language used to describe young people's health has turned quite so grave, and to put some numbers on this, is Andrea Smith. She's from the MRC's Epidemiology Unit at the University of Cambridge, where she specialises in children's health. So, Andrea, what's the scale of this? So I think when we think about child physical health, one of the main indicators that we can look at is childhood obesity. The UK National Child Measurement Programme released some data which showed that we have seen the highest annual rise in childhood obesity rates in the last decade. So we now know that actually by the time a child starts primary school, nearly 28% of children already have obesity, overweight. And by the time that they leave primary school, just under 41% already have childhood um, obesity and overweight. And these numbers really speak to a, a grave scale of the problem. Childhood obesity, of course, is shaped by many complex factors. But during the pandemic, all children were told to stay at home and were losing out on a lot of other social structures and systems. I recall seeing the report that was titled The State of the Nation's Wastelines, which actually predated the pandemic. And in that, we saw this already happening. So we can't just blame covid for this. So why are we seeing this inexorable and now accelerating rate of childhood obesity in such young kids? So when we look at trends in childhood obesity, there is a huge divide in terms of social deprivation. So we know when we look at these numbers that children living in the most deprived areas are actually twice as likely to have childhood obesity compared to children who live in less deprived areas. And when we look at the numbers, we can also see that actually ethnicity is also closely linked to child weight, with particularly black children more likely to be living with obesity. And what do you attribute that to? So we know that deprivation affects health behaviours. So families that are struggling to put aside money to purchasing healthy foods are more likely to resort to higher calorie and less nutrient dense snacks and also are less likely to have the um, extra money to put into expensive kind of hobbies. So children tend to have less higher quality diets and also tend to move less, which overall results in a positive energy balance, which increases their risk for childhood obesity. But we have always had people who are poorer in society. So if it was purely how well off you are, then surely we should have seen this trend a long time ago and we didn't. It's much more recent than that, isn't it? So there must be other factors alongside the, the, the very important issues of deprivation and the points you've made. Of course. So it is. this um, goes hand in hand with changes in our environment. So we know that our current environments are incredibly what we like to call obesogenic. They make very palatable and high energy dense foods 
easily available and they, they make movement less kind of appealing and less of a, an easy option, so, which results in an overall positive energy balance. What about the other important thing we raised at the top of the programme, Andrea, which is mental health and ill health? What's happening there? So, of course, physical and mental health are closely related in lots of different ways. But we also can see from data that were released by the Health Foundation that as a result of the pandemic, a lot more children and young people have been accessing mental health services. And this speaks to the loss of their usual routines and usual support mechanisms and their ability to connect with friends. And I mean, one only has to think think of back in deep, dark lockdown days where we lost the ability to have contact with friends. And I think this is really important in the early years where social contact is very important for mental health. And it's all linked and feeds back, doesn't it? Andrea, thank you very much indeed for bringing it all together for us. That was Andrea Smith. She's from the MRC Epidemiology Unit at Cambridge University. James. Andrea has outlined just there how important physical activity will be to any improvement in the mental and physical health of our youngsters, particularly those who are worst off. To facilitate this, they need places to play. And unfortunately, we don't always make it as easy as we should. Fields and Trust is a charity which aims to legally protect our parks and green spaces, working with landowners and local authorities to ensure these sites are reserved for public recreational use indefinitely. Helen Griffiths, Chief Executive and a member of the Government's Parks Access Group, told me why their work is so crucial. So at Fields and Trust, we've done some research into this to try and look at what the overall provision of parks and green space access looks like across the whole of the country. And we know that Approximately 3 million people live more than a 10 minute walk from a local park or green space. And that 10 minute walk metric is is a really important one because if it's within a 10 minute walk, then you are more likely to use that space on a on a regular basis. And that's also particularly relevant when we're thinking about access for children as they begin to, you know, to forge some independence. The fact that those spaces need to be within a safe and walkable distance from from where they live. There is lots of variation across the piece, and that's really interesting when we also start to think about where those inequities of provision are, because we know, again, from our green space index, that those areas that perform worst in terms of the amount of green space provision that they have, 40% of those are in the highest priority areas for the government's levelling up agenda. So we know that there is a you know a correlation between those areas of, of deprivation, those more challenged communities, and not having good access to, to outdoor green space, which is really important when we think about the fact that one in eight households also don't have access to a private green space. So if you don't have a garden or a yard at home, the park is so much more important. It is your back garden. What you're saying is that it's not all down to the pull of being indoors, to the pull of the games console or the iPad, but being pushed away from playing outside because of the limitations on access to parks and green spaces. It worries me as well what you were saying about the inequalities, families from lower incomes who are bearing the brunt of this, those without access to gardens, which follows because they're the ones who are suffering at the moment, those children with the poorest physical and mental health. But quantifying that must be tricky. Have you tried? Because that's presumably what the politicians and the councils need to see to take some action on this issue. I mean, you're completely right in that it is a very difficult issue to be able to put some numbers on. How do you value that service that by its very nature needs to be free at the point of of access? So we have done some studies to try and be able to create a more robust business case. So what is the value of our parks and, and green spaces? How can we quantify that value so that we can make a better case for investment in them? We've looked at the wellbeing value that is generated by parks and green spaces, and it is enormous. So the wellbeing value is a whopping £34.2 billion a year. And we arrived at that by looking at the ONS questions around subjective wellbeing. So what would it cost us to replace that wellbeing for the whole of the, of the population if we needed to, if we didn't have access to those, to those spaces? 
I think there's also a question around making sure from a behavioural perspective that we are encouraging children to be able to use those spaces and that they feel safe in those spaces. And obviously parents are a big part of that in encouraging their children to participate in play and to take risks as part of that developmental piece that is so important as part of children's play. Helen Griffiths from Fields in Trust. The Naked Scientists podcast is produced in association with Spitfire. Cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. Music in the programme is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for audio and video productions. You're listening to The Naked Scientists with me, Chris Smith, and with James Sicko. Now, that last point that Helen made about children being given the freedom to use play areas whenever and in whatever way they see fit is regarded as central to this next part of the programme, and that's because we're going to be talking about adventurous or risky play. For those not entirely familiar with those terms, all will soon be made clear. I was lucky enough to be able to visit a special facility here in Cambridgeshire, the New Ark Adventure Playground in Peterborough. I spoke to some adventure play experts as well as some adults who have been studying and working in the area for years. Hello, my name's Samantha Brown and I'm the manager of Newark. I'm Dr Lily Fitzgibbon. I'm a researcher of child development in the Division of Psychology at the University of Stirling. My name is Robert Dighton and I'm the chief executive at LHAP. LHAP is one of very few adventure playgrounds set up and designed for disabled children. Originally, adventure playgrounds were built in bomb sites and the idea was that it was a space where children could build and destroy their own play spaces they were the masters of their own play destiny so so it's quite a revolutionary concept adventure play is a microcosm of the play that we used to do 30 40 years ago without giving it a name it's the play that as, as children most of us encountered when we'd play in the streets, by the rivers, in the forest. It was a sense of freedom, a sense where we learn our own limits, our own potential, our own abilities and disabilities. It it was playing freely away and outside of the adult's world. It's the kind of play that that makes children shriek or kind of uh, bunch up their hands in excitement. But the the idea is that they're they're taking some, some risks but they, they're managing those risks themselves. Children come in and the very first time they look at the adventure playground and it's like, wow, yeah. they're in awe yeah. basically with what they see. And through supervised risky play, they can extend their learning and social skills. All children are experiencing a, a, a play deprivation. You think play, play is a recreational and leisure term, isn't it? It feels such a luxury. And yet we know that anybody working in play understands, you know, from adventure playgrounds right through to play therapy and child psychotherapy, we know that play is a serious business. It's an essential component to childhood. There's a risk aversion generally. There's a, 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 a kind of burgeoning problem in parents don't want their children to play outside in the streets or certainly not in rivers and in forests as as I did as a child. So so children's worlds are restricting. They are becoming smaller and smaller each year. And COVID, I think, accelerated that massively. So in some theoretical work led by Professor Helen Dodd, she suggested that adventurous play is a means for children to learn how to cope with the kinds of physical sensations and emotional experiences that they might have in their everyday lives. By having these experiences in a kind of positive, playful environment, they learn how to cope with them. And then if they come across them in more difficult situations, then they may be more resilient. And so we suggest that through these mechanisms, adventurous play may be a means of reducing um, or protecting children from anxiety. Yeah, my name's Claudia. And how old are you? I am nine, turning ten this year. Brooke. And how old are you, Brooke? Uh, Eleven. Eleven. (laughs) (laughs) It took you a minute there. And what do you think? What do you make of it since you've been here? So, that black slide over there, Yeah. 
Yeah. Tell me, tell me about it. So basically, we have these cones that are near those tyres, which is my other favourite thing. Yeah, yeah. But we also have those cones where we can just originally just spin around on it on the floor. But we usually take them over to the black slide over there. We go backwards or forwards on it and we just roll down on it. It's fun but dangerous as well. It, it looks a bit dangerous. Have you, have you hurt yourself doing it yet? Um, <laughs> um, I've got a headache. Um, but I, I always laughed every time I ever fell. Um, I really liked the zip line, but sadly it was broken. And then... Do things get broken quite a lot? Yeah. Yeah. We found this blue bucket and like we can yeah. hide our whole entire body inside of it so then we're all secure. I saw you chucking yourself down the <laughs> side and it's just your legs poking out the end of it. I haven't hurt myself badly, but I've chipped one of my nails. Okay. And Today. bent my nails. Ouch. Well, I really like the swings. Right. Um, well, I mean, I've got, I've stumbled over a few times, maybe got a few bruises, a few scratches, but nothing too serious. That's good to hear. What about playing at school, playing at home? Well, how does it compare to playing here? Is this, is this way better? This is way better, right. and at home, there's not really, you can't fit like a whole playground in your backyard. Yeah. How do you feel about the fact that not all kids get to play at a playground like this? Well, I mean, it's a bit sad because without this, let's say you're stuck at home, you're bored, you have nothing to do, whereas here you can get out, exercise, play a lot. Our data really suggests that children from underprivileged backgrounds have the most to gain from access to these adventurous play spaces or places that afford adventurous play like green spaces and so they also are likely to have the most to lose in terms of both their physical and mental health but it's really crucial that these kinds of spaces remain open and that children from lower income backgrounds continue to have access to them that they don't just become a kind of luxury of the financially secure there's a problem in in that the, there's there is no funding and play was always seen as a kind of a luxury and it's to our, you know, it's to our detriment. We, we could quadruple our services, and I don't think we'd touch the sides. We have been fortunate enough to have received funding from the local authorities. Unfortunately, they have not got the funds within their budget to be able to fund us anymore. And we understand that, and we are doing all that we can to ensure the future of Newark. Thanks to Robert Dighton, Lily Fitzgibbon, Samantha Brown and some of those children at the Newark Adventure Playground. Did you ever go on anything? Did you did you chip any nails or I felt I had to maintain my journalistic integrity, Chris, and, and I was just there to observe, I'm afraid. Now this week uh, we're looking at the challenges that are facing kids that are growing up in 21st century Britain and countries like it. We've just heard about the struggle to promote adventurous physical play, which is judged by many to be critical to mental resilience and also good physical health. But the devil, as always, is in the detail. And Tim Gill is an independent researcher and writer. He's also a global advocate for children's play and the author of Urban Playground, How Child-Friendly Planning and Design Can Save Cities. And Tim's with us. One of the topics, Tim, that keeps on coming up again and again and again is the idea that, that children are now growing up in a gilded cage. We basically protect them, but we're doing that at their cost. So what sort of damage are are we potentially doing to children by doing this? Thanks for having me on. It's, uh, I think what's happening is that sort of well-meaning attempts by adults, uh, parents and others to protect children from all possible harm is actually depriving children of the kind of experiences that Uh, in reality, help them to learn how to cope and to get along in an uncertain world. And I I think that there's always a balancing act here. But for for really some decades, I would say, um, culturally, there's been a shift towards what I sometimes call a a a kind of philosophy of protection, and that we need instead to to remind ourselves of the value of allowing children to, to find out for themselves how to get along, how to deal with challenges, and and how to cope with tricky situations. Indeed, one of our other producers on the programme said that when she was little, she used to go out and play on the street and it wasn't till 10 o'clock at night and mum would call out the window, time to come in and everyone would come in. You just don't see that sort of behaviour anymore. 
Yes, I think I talk in my work about the sort of shrinking horizons of childhood um, and, and that in children's everyday lives have become more and more constrained and more and more watched over by adults. And that's really a long standing trend that goes goes back generations, as, as you've hinted. And, and there are complex reasons for that. Um, I actually think that the, 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 the physical qualities of neighbourhoods uh, are one of the factors. You know, traffic is a real and, and present danger for children in many neighbourhoods. Um, and that's in many neighbourhoods has been growing. But I think there is also this cultural shift uh, that, that, that we've just talked about around around an overprotective mindset with children. And those two things come together and children are the ones who lose out. Andrea was saying at the beginning that this is most marked in terms of physical ill health and mental ill health amongst the poorest communities. Does that apply necessarily here, though? Because is it that the kids with better off parents are more likely to have a cushioned life and therefore may be more at risk of of having their horizons blunted in the way you're describing? Well, it's certainly true that the sort of everyday freedoms that children have vary from place to place and with different children and obviously with children of different ages. Also, girls have much less freedom than boys and that I think is significant. We don't know enough, I think, about the some of the social class aspects uh, of this. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it'd be easy to, to sort of turn to stereotypes. Um, I, my hunch is that, uh, if I could put it this way, sort of outdoor play and, and an outdoor play culture is more resilient in some pockets of towns and cities than others, uh, perhaps for a combination of reasons, partly because of the, the physical properties of those neighbourhoods. Maybe, you know, traffic isn't such an issue or there are uh, good space, green spaces nearby. Maybe also partly for cultural and social reasons to do with the the level of trust and, and the kind of contact between families. So I, I wouldn't want to make any wider generalisations than that. It sounds like the sort of growing up equivalent of the champions of the hygiene hypothesis who say we all need to play in dirt more because... That's why we're seeing loads of allergies. Our obsession with sterility is giving our immune system nothing to do. This seems like the behavioural equivalent of that. So what sort of solutions can you foresee that would be easily implementable to sort of row back onto this corner we've painted ourselves into? Um, I think that's quite a good analogy, um, by the way. And I'd say a a couple of things. Firstly, there, there are opportunities in schools, for instance, to open up school break times and lunch times to bring in a bit more adventurous and, and, and challenging free play. And there are actually hundreds of schools across the UK now that are, that are doing things like bringing in, you know, scrap materials and junk and, and something that's not a million miles away from that adventure playground scene that we heard earlier. And, 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 and teachers and school leaders are seeing amazing results uh, in terms of children's behaviour and just children enjoying their school life more. So that's one side. I think there's also really interesting work, and I'm promoting some of it in my own work, around making neighbourhoods more child friendly, tackling traffic, uh, uh, you know, opening up green spaces, making it easier to walk and cycle around neighbourhoods, even simple things like um, having sessions maybe once a week uh, where the uh, through traffic in a street or through traffic outside a school is stopped for a few hours simply so that children can come out and play. Um, It's a model that's been promoted by an NGO called uh, a charity called Playing Out based in Bristol. And again, that's been taken up by communities across the UK and beyond. So I think there are there are promising, you know, green shoots about how uh, at different levels, uh, parents, communities and also uh, decision makers and councils can can make a difference here. It's good that we've recognised that there is a problem and perhaps we're at a turning point. Tim Gill, thank you. Yeah, thanks to Tim and all of our guests today. I think what we've learned is that eliminating any risk kids might encounter robs them of something that comes naturally to them, which is to have accidents and to learn from them. Modern technology and screens and things are not going anywhere, and why should they? The upsides to adults and children are like a massive. So hopefully it's a case moving forward of us offering better provisions for kids to more freely explore the physical environments they're in and to benefit from the luxuries of growing up in the 21st century, but also to enjoy the privilege to play adventurously. Well, I certainly played adventurously when I was little, and uh, and I know it made a huge impact on me.
That's it for this week, but do please tune in at the same time next week when we're going to be going on a voyage through space, but we will be keeping our feet firmly on Cambridgeshire ground. The Naked Scientist comes to you from the University of Cambridge's Institute of Continuing Education. It's supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Chris Smith. Thanks for listening, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>